Hey, I'm your host, Scott Herf. Today, I had the honor of sitting down with Jay Nathan, a customer success veteran and expert. He's the chief customer officer at Higher Logic and the co-founder of the Gain, Grow, Retain customer success leadership community. Now, this is one of the premier customer success communities out there. It's 12,000 members, tens of thousands of weekly readers. Check it out if you can, gaingrowretain.com. In this episode, you're gonna learn how to lead and scale SaaS customer success teams. And that's really important to do it efficiently because this is a world where there's no more free money. I also want you to be ready. You're gonna get to hear a little bit of breaking news on this one, so please enjoy. What's up, Jay? Good to see you, man. I figured we'd start by just chatting a little bit about what you're working on now and uh, what you're into. Yeah, sounds good. Good to see you, Scott. Um, So um, as you mentioned in the intro, I am the chief customer officer and actually um, a slightly modified role at Higher Logic too, where I'm the general manager of one of our business units. And so uh, my days right now are occupied with um, sort of pathfinding on our go-to-market strategy. We're working really hard on a on a partner strategy uh, at Higher Logic for for the products that my team sells. And so um, working working real hard on that. That's a the ecosystem play is so important these days. And so we uh, right. put a lot of energy into it. Um, other than that, it's just you know keeping customers and, and retaining them. I also do a lot of writing. So um, got a couple of projects there I'm working on as well, which is impressive. I mean, I I find it writing to be clarifying, but finding the time for that, carving that out, it's you know it's like getting your reps in or eating your broccoli sometimes. But then once you do it, you feel amazing, right? Yeah, there, you know, there's no such thing as an overnight success, right? Most right. Of the most people that appear successful out of nowhere have been diligently working away at things for years, sometimes. And uh, uh, writing is just one of those things for me that it, to your point, it does help clarify my thinking. Whether it's thinking about things that are happening in my personal life or things that I'm trying to accomplish from a business perspective, and I think that has been. Um, one thing, one unexpected benefit of spending so much time writing is that it's just clarified my thinking so much. Um, and it's now it's more of a habit than anything to just write every single day. So I love that. I mean, and I, and I like how you, you format it, distribute it, distill it down because it's so consumable, but so you can tell it's just been refined, right? It's that, um, the phenomenon of uh, the rock tumbler Steve Jobs yeah. used to talk about where you've got all these, you know, ideas working, you know, together in this, uh, I'm going to butcher the metaphor, but, you know, everything seems just so punchy and refined. And I always come away after reading one of your posts, like, oh, okay, I'm going to pause and think on that. So <laughs> I appreciate you putting that out into the world. And then you've got uh, Gain, Grow, Retain, right? Your, your huge community of... Um, CS professionals. Yeah. So yeah, great call out. We, um, we launched a community called Gang Grow Retain. We call it GGR for short because it's a little bit of a mouthful, but <laughs> uh, we launched it back in. So we did, we started a podcast back in 2019. And, um, you know, of course we had a blog and everything. I had a consulting firm back then. And, and we were using this community strategy in the blog and the podcast, much like we use it here at, at Churnkey, right? You use it to help you know, educate the market, draw attention right. to the brand. We were doing the same thing for for the consulting firm. We worked with B two B tech companies on their um, customer success strategies. We were a management consulting firm, basically, is what we were. But we built this community, and um, during the pandemic, it just exploded. People wanted to talk to each other. They wanted to figure out, okay, we're seeing this at our company. Are you seeing the same thing? Yeah. And what are you going to do about it? And how's it going to work? And uh, we, we just sort of caught lightning in a bottle um, back in like early 2020 when the pandemic started. We started it actually, the community was really started with a, a weekly Zoom call. We called it CS Leadership Office Hours. Wow. And first week we had 50 people. The next week we had 75. Then we had 125 and it just kept growing and growing and growing. And people started to pull from us. They said, hey, if like we're getting together every week, we'd love to be able to chat in between these calls as well and, and make personal connections and have content and, you know, be able to, you know, so we, we built an online community. We now have live events that are part of that. We still run those office hours calls, which are really important to create person to person connections. Um, because that's really what community is, right? It's all about connecting right. people and knowledge and ideas. And so 
um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it turn, turns out to have been one of the more fun professional things that I've done in my life. And it was almost completely serendipitous. Like we did not set out to build a community of 12,000 people. We just didn't. Unreal. It just happened. And, and our mantra from the start was, let's just give as much value as we can. Just right. give, give, give. And, and over time, it's come back you know, tenfold to us. But we just continue with that mantra today. How do we keep giving our community members more value? Yeah, it's fun to see that DNA still carry through with the office hours. I mean, that schedule was incredibly robust and that's a, that's tough to pull off, you know, and, and it's really impressive, especially with that scale of people. Yeah, we had to learn how to facilitate big Zoom calls. That was, yeah. we were using Zoom and luckily Zoom was available to us um, in 2020. And um, so yeah, we, it was a new skill set we had to learn to be able to facilitate that. But lots more stories we can share from from GGR, you know, as we as we continue to chat. Right on. Gangrowretain.com. It's uh yeah. it's good stuff. Um so you've you've been thinking deeply about you know SaaS companies and, and customer relationships for a long time and and what we're seeing now and and you know, we're feeling this at Churnkey too, where we're it's market correction and you know, in search of efficiency and and you know, the realization that cheap money and spending your way out of problems is no longer the reality. And I want to get your perspective on, you know, what needs to happen within SaaS companies to maintain deep customer relationships while, while being efficient. Um, Cause you know, that's the root of all, of all SaaS success really. Yeah. Um, no, you, you, well said. I often say that SaaS companies are customer success machines, right? You have to make your customers successful if you want to win as a business, it's just there, there's no separating the two because the cost of acquisition is so high for right. customers. And if they only stay for a year or 18 months or 24 months, you're probably going to be upside down as you continue to grow. Um, so, you know, I think if you look at the past 10 or 15 years in the SaaS ecosystem, as you pointed out, there's been a ton of money that's been pumped into here. And, you know, a lot of the folks that, institutionally invest in companies like Churnkey and Higher Logic, you know, they know on the surface level that you need to have a customer success team, right? Everybody should just have that. And we want you to go scale up sales and marketing. So you need to go hire some more BDRs. You need to go hire salespeople. But there's a lot of nuance in each of these businesses. And um, what I've found is that even customer success teams have sort of th- just thrown a lot of spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. And it's not yeah. been very efficient. Um, customer success as it's sort of grown and evolved over the past 10 or 15 years has really come from a place of very high touch. So think like high touch account management, um, you know, calls with your customers every week. That's one thing. If you've got big enterprise customers, you have to do that, right? You can't avoid that. But there's a lot of companies out there, especially a lot of the types of companies that Churnkey serves that serves hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of very small businesses. So what does customer success look like there? It's completely different, but some of the same technologies and techniques that you use to engage large audiences also work in enterprise. Because guess what? Enterprise companies don't necessarily want to be on the phone talking to you every day because they use 20 other products just like yours, right? right? So they need to know it's working. They need to know that if they have a problem, they can submit a, a an issue to the to the company to do the support channel and it's going to get resolved correctly and quickly and then they want strategic guidance like what does it look what do my peers look like am i performing as well as they are or do i need to be doing things differently so when we think about scaling customer success we think about content the best practices the webinars the office hours all the kind of stuff we did for ggr we think about the same kind of techniques for scaling and making that customer success function more more uh, efficient because it yeah. really is all about enablement and the product enablement of the best practices and processes, and then you know ma- making sure that <clears throat> customers are adopting and getting the usage out of the product that they need to prove its value. It's 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 really interesting. You connecting growing GGR in a way that you would you would scale a, cu- a you know customer success team or operations. It's really interesting comparison. Um, kind of like turn the light bulb on in my head right now. But um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting that customer success has this um, high-touch enterprise reputation. Um, and it's one of the more interesting dynamics about um, 
the topic in my opinion, because, um, you know, I, I don't know why it's gotten that reputation of being, you know, sloggy and expensive and I got to get on a call yeah, again with this guy. Right. Yeah. Because it has been, yeah, it has been sloggy and, and expensive and inefficient in my opinion. So I think you're, you're spot on. Yeah. Well, and, and, and that segues when we spoke earlier, you said something that I loved where uh, when you're advising companies, you're, you're, uh, you know, your question is, well, how can I convince you to not create a customer success team? Um, and that's just so, you know, that's, that's what you do. This is your role. This is what you love to do. But, you know, hearing you say that, it just, you know, I want to know like, what, you know, what would you do instead? Why is this? What does that mean? Right? Yeah. I had a call with a friend of mine from the community a, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he's in a new role. A uh, company just got a big funding round. You know, it's a series C, series C uh, round of fun, funding, big one, like a nine figure kind of deal. And he's like, "Yeah, I got brought in to to build out the customer success function." And I, and I asked him a bunch of questions, and um, like, you know, first question is like, "What is your gross retention rate?" Well, it's above ninety five percent. That's fantastic. That's world class, right? Like, right. so. Where's the problem? Like, what problem are you solving? And, um, you know, it, it's CSM teams, because that's sort of the, the thing, right? In customer success, you often think about a team of CSMs. Yep. Um, but, and, and it's, but that's a blunt force instrument, right? A CSM team is a high cost blunt force instrument that's only going to give you so much reach across your customer base because it's so high touch. So when, when I think about customer success, I think about it as, that's the outcome that we're trying to drive, right? It's it's not renewals, it's not upselling, it's not advocacy, um, it's not even adoption. It's like, is the customer getting the getting what they thought they were buying, right? Are they are they getting that result, that outcome? Now, how yep. we help the customer get that is what we call customer success is like a team or a function. It could be CSM. CSMs are a customer success channel or a channel of engaging with your with your customers. But there's other things you can do too. And it comes back to this community concept. Every company, I think, should have an online community. Of course, I think that because that's the product my company yeah. sells. But um, it's a way of letting customers connect with one another, right? And learn from one another because oftentimes customers have better insights because they sit in the exact same role as your other customers versus you. Your CSMs don't necessarily have that direct, hands on, been in the seat experience. Right. Um, so communities are really important for helping drive uh, just the, the overall feeling that I'm part of something bigger, right? Like, yes, I'm buying a product from Churnkey or from Higher Logic, but I'm actually part of their ecosystem too. And they're, they have tons of resources and people for me to network with so I can become better at my job and better at using their products. So yeah, that's powerful. Um, that's, you know, that, that's one thing. When I think about you know, the, the statement that I made to you about I'm going to convince you not to hire a CSM team. But the, the, the question that I asked my buddy, you know, when he described what he was looking at doing is like, okay, you have an, the other thing he, he shared with me is that there's an account management team who's doing a lot of the quote unquote customer success functions. Like they're meeting with customers, they're handling escalations, they're, you know, doing the value and ROI report outs with the customer, the kind of thing, the, the proactive engagement you'd expect from a CSM team. Yeah. My question is, well, okay, if you look across that team, it sounds like they're already doing a lot of this work, but what's one thing that they're doing? And if you could take that one task off of their plates across the whole team, what, what would that look like? And could you specialize a role to just go do that one thing? So we talked about billing inquiries, right? They handle all the billing inquiries. Well, why not centralize that? in one person who can just go handle that. Maybe they're part of the finance team. Maybe they're part of the renewal team. Um, so to me, it's all about looking at what's working today. How do you leverage that without creating something brand new if you don't already have it? Like if you don't already have a CSM team, why create it? But do start layering in things that give you leverage and scale on what is already working. So maybe it's billing inquiries. Maybe it's a support team. Or maybe it's an onboarding function that just specializes in that onboarding, that new customer implementation motion that has to be done well and done right every right. single time without fail, right? And so I think of the world, you know, as you grow a SaaS company, as you scale your customer success practice, really about 
uh, or I think about the world in terms of creating specialist roles that handle very specific moments in the customer journey along the way. That's powerful. I mean, and I love to jump into that. Um, I I love process and uh, you know uh, just you know examples of the the practicalities of of things. And what would you say are the top few practical achievable examples of of scaling customer success? So you mentioned one, um, you know, a, a few there, but where are some like must haves in your experience? Well, the the you know early on in in a company's stage when you're at the seed round or maybe yeah. even your A round of funding, you, you may just have a team of what people might refer to today as like a full stack CSM. Like it's a person who handles the support requests. If a renewal is coming up, they might have a conversation with the customer. They're doing it all. They're a right. quote unquote jack or jill of all trades, right? Um, but the oftentimes the first functional roles that need to be scaled inside of a SaaS company are going to be your support team, your support yep. function, right? Because it's very specific. When a customer reaches out to you, you want to be able to respond to them as quickly as possible and solve that issue as fast as possible. Right. Um, the other one, like I mentioned, is onboarding or implementation, however you look at that, but it's getting your new users off the ground. And if you have enough new users coming in or new customers coming in, onboarding, it's a little bit like support, right? When it ha- when, when a new customer comes on board, you, do, it's, you have to react to that. You have to go do the work to get them implemented. Now, you know, in a product like growth model, your product may guide them through that process. Yeah. But you know, for anything, anything else, like onboarding is is super critical in SaaS, right? And and so it should be specialized pretty early in my because right, they've the customers clear time in their schedule. Maybe they've gotten engineers, whoever on board, were teed up, ready to go. The button's not working, you know, or or whatever, right? Right. I need an answer now, right? Because right. I'm trying to use a product, but it's not now it's not doing what it's supposed to do. So right. that's got to be lightning fast. And there's got to be a deep connection with the engineering function for for that type of issue, right? So we can get it resolved quickly. Um, you know, once a company gets you know their first tranche of customers through the initial term of their agreements with you, you know, some companies sign customers up on a monthly recurring basis and it's, you can turn it off or on anytime. Right. In a lot of enterprise SaaS, you know, B2B, you're actually signing annual agreements for things. So Maybe a one, two, or three-year contract. But when those contracts start coming up for renewal, you need to, you need to be able to reliably renew those contracts. And to do that, you know, one of the roles that I've had a lot of success creating in my career is a renewal manager role, which basically takes all the commercial negotiation of a renewal off the plate of a CSM or off the plate of a sales team who needs to be, you know, ideally booking new, new business, new, new logo uh, bookings. Right. And, and it centralizes it and you can have one or two people be really, really good at renewal price increases, you know, annually and uh, you know, maybe a little bit of expansion there as well. And so that it, at least in my experience is, is much better done centralize into a specialist kind of role. And there, there are a number of other roles like that. Um, when you think about developing content in webinars for your customers, like who does that, right? The run-of-the-mill CSM doesn't have experience. That looks more like a marketing kind of role when you think right. about the tools and the process of facilitating a one-to-many engagement with a customer, whether it's around the product roadmap in a webinar or it's you know around a certain topic that we're trying to educate our customers on in the product. So there's all kinds of opportunities for specialization as you grow, right? And you have right. to sort of think through it as you grow. In that example, would um, would you be, would the customer success role be leading that webinar or would they, they be feeding marketing the, the content for that? Or, or maybe both? Maybe both. Yeah. Yeah. It's really a matter of who's organizing that program. Yeah. Right. Because it's back to the skill set thing. Traditionally, the CSM skill set is a relationship manager, a product expert, a coach, consultant. Right. Right. So when, when I think about, they're going to get a lot of stories that come out of their interactions with customers and they're going to be able to identify, okay, this customer is. They're really doing things better than anybody else, and we should put them in the spotlight. So they can be a really valuable source of recruiting people to participate in these things, both from as a participant and as a leader. 
in them. And then they can um, also um, pro- be a valuable source of content because they're ears to the ground constantly, right? right. Uh, and they're getting great feedback. Now, what we have to train CSMs to do is be attuned to the, what they're hearing and know that it's the role they play is more than just the conversations they had with those customers that day. Totally. Right? Yes, that's important, but it's also important for you to bring those insights back to the business so we can load up our, our scaled programs with great content, great ideas, and great people that, um, that they're coming across in their day-to-day work with them. Yeah, that is, that's one thing we're, we're trying to work on at Churnkey where, um, you know, both to recognize patterns uh, and to recognize, you know, new developments, but also not to be, you know, what's, what's the phenomenon where a doctor learns about some disease and then they diagnose that disease, you know, yeah. <laughs> every time thereafter for a little while. So, um, you know, not to get too stuck in the mud on, on certain feedback on certain days. Right. So it's a very human problem, but it really but is. I, I, I'd rather have that than being caught by surprise, you know, with, with cancellations or f- negative feedback or whatever. Right. 100%. Um, so who, who are some customer or what, co- what companies do you admire that are customer centric and that are doing really innovative things with customer success? Great question. So, um, I, I actually, the, the, I have a little bit of recency bias on this too. <laughs> Maybe that's what you were mentioning there with the doctors. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I've been reading um, Invent and Wonder by Jeff Bezos. Um, and basically, Invent and Wonder is the collective writings of Jeff Bezos. So it's really just a collection of of his shareholder letters and other you know writings on certain topics that he's done right. over the years. And I I love Amazon. Probably doesn't even have a customer success team, right? Yeah, I mean. They, they they may somewhere across their vast empire they they probably have a CS team somewhere, but what I love about Amazon and why I consider them one of the most customer centric customer companies in the world is because their innovation is based on customer centricity. They built you know Amazon Marketplace to show third party seller products next to products that they sell themselves right right. right. And many people, including many members of their board, were like, you are crazy. What are you doing? Why would you do that? You cannibalize your own sales. Because they know that it's not, about ma- it's not about maximizing the value of any single transaction. It's about maximizing the lifetime value of that customer and having them... I mean, Scott, how many things have you ordered off of Amazon in your life? I couldn't even tell you at this point. Yeah, it's probably embarrassing for me to, to tell you. Um over the past 15 years is nuts. Exactly. Right. Now we go back there because we know we've got the best selection. Um, right. You know, another thing, they, um, when they made the decision to allow reviews of products on yep. the site, people were like, why would you do that? What if they give negative reviews? Well, it's, it's all about the customer. So the customer is going to be better educated. They're going to trust us and they're going to come back and buy more. And you know you see that flywheel. He calls yep. it a flywheel of growth um, a lot in how they've built that business, and and it just permeates through every part of it. Amazon Web Services, Marketplace, Prime; those are all very customer centric ideas that yeah. you know they they knew were going to be costly when they launched them, but they had faith that they were going to feed that flywheel and the you know the sum of the lifetime value of transactions was going to far outweigh any single transaction that they could do with their customers. So Amazon totally. right now is just my favorite. And, yeah. and I love reading about them and and learning more about their culture of innovation for customers. I was actually working in e-commerce when they launched the third-party marketplace in Raleigh, actually, your, kind of your neck of the woods, yeah. uh, back in like 07. And... Um, yeah, people were calling them crazy. You're competing against yourself. And, you know, but it was enabled by this other innovation they had, which seems obvious at the time or now, but it wasn't at the time where, you know, their main competition was eBay. And if you search for, say, I don't know, I'm looking at my kid's Lego set. So search for a Star Wars Lego set, you get different listing pages of the same product. Well, 
an example of them being customer centric was, well, that product should have one page, you know, the, and, and a single, what they call, you know, the, the ASIN. And then, you know, all these, um, listings roll up under that page and it's just a better search shopping experience for everyone enables reviews and all that stuff so um ebay's never recovered from that no yeah i mean ebay's i mean they're still doing okay right but they're a distant second and you know the the cool thing about the cultural the way that works culturally at amazon is they they tried an auction site too i believe uh, yeah they did yeah with, with ebay and it ended up failing and they said all right Let's move right. on to the next thing. So they're not afraid to take chances on behalf of their customers to, to find. It's like the overnight success thing, right? Marketplace right. wasn't a success overnight. They had two or three failed tries at it before they hit on what the right idea was with the product pages that you mentioned and everything. So Yeah. And many, many companies would have just ditched it after the first one, right? Oh, yeah. Of course. Or they would have tried one of the tactics. They would have tried to copy one of the tactics that they saw their competitors doing that worked. Yep. In isolation of having the whole culture of innovation, of driving prices down, of making selection bigger, of making information more democratized. Like that's a cultural thing. And if you do any one of those things in isolate, you know, another uh, another very customer centric company is Southwest Airlines. Great story oh, yeah. there, right? They they but but they, they start by being very clear about who they are and who they are not. They'll tell you, like, if you want a, you know, a first class seat on an airplane, like, don't fly Southwest because we're not doing that, right? They know who their customer is and they serve them relentlessly with the same. It, so other airlines have tried to copy, you know, the cultural, the fun aspect of what Southwest does, and they've tried to, you know, pare back some of the benefits, but they haven't adopted the entire mindset, the entire culture that Southwest Airlines does. So. All they're doing is adding more cost and less revenue to their to their books, right? And, and they're they're not actually winning. Yeah, culturally. not a winning formula. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Love it. Um, well, I want to shift back to you and the work you're doing real quick. And we got a little breaking news here. You're joining Turnkey's board of advisors, which is something we're all extremely excited about, and and we're finally ready to let out to the world. We've been, you know, chomping at the bit to tell people about this. Um, you know, we're huge fans of your work and your thinking and just admire how you, um, you know, reinforce the importance of being customer centric. It's one of our values. Um, but also, you know, the, we just discussed the practical realities of actually doing that. It's not just some, you know, just some platitude or whatnot. So yeah, we're crazy excited. Um, Breaking news here, guys. Yeah, uh, very exciting. And you know, it's it's almost like serendipity in a lot of ways because half yeah. your team is based here in Charleston, <laughs> yeah. uh, which you know, how many software companies are actually based here? Oh, I know, but not that many. Um, and how many? And then to have a software company, you know, with half of its team in Charleston, focused on essentially what is a subset of customer success is just super exciting. So I'm, yeah. I'm just happy that the network, the the skill set, the exposure that I've had over the past 20 years just happens to be, it's that happens to line up perfectly with what y'all are doing. And I can it really does about it. So, yeah. um, you know, when I looked at Churnkey, I've known Baird for a lot of years, actually I used to work with his wife at, at a, at a former uh, company that we were both at. And, but, um, as I got to know more about Churnkey, you know, when I here, here's some good advice maybe for your listeners. Yeah, uh, at least I think it's good advice when you're evaluating a company, whether it's to invest in or join as an employee or become an executive of or join the advisory board of. There are three things to look for. The one number one is are are you in a good market, right? The market you really want to be when you choose a company to do anything with. You want to be on top of a wave, not under it as I like to say. Um, and I mean, just look at the world of subscriptions, right? It is exploding right now. Not only can you buy software on subscription, which is you know one of the, one of the earlier companies yep. to take advantage of this, but I mean, look at Costco, right? I'm a member yep. at Costco. Um, I can get my haircut and my car wash. I can buy that on subscription now. There, there's so many... I, I heard the other day that Taco Bell was trying out a subscription service 
Scott, did you know that? Sign me up. Crunch Crunch Supreme. Supreme. Yeah. Yeah. T A A S. Um, (laughs) So I don't know if that'll stick or not, but um, but it's clear that Churnkey was on a on a market wave right now. Has has found the right wave. So excited about that. Number two thing I look for is the product. Is the product good? Because if the product sucks, it's going to be a slog. And I've been in situations where you know the product was not in a good spot. We had to really work at it to to get it into that spot, but um, you know, just looking at the product and how clean and tight it is. Obviously, it's a it's 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 only been born over the past few years. It's on the latest and greatest technologies, which makes it lightning fast for us to iterate yep. on it. Customers, um, it's performant. It stands up to you know the task. Um, so, you know, the, the, the product is excellent. By the way, even the analytics capabilities of what Churnkey can do and the, the visibility that it gets. One of the things that I love as a customer success leader is working with a product where you can very visibly see the outcome of using it, right? right. And luckily, Churnkey deals with an area of the customer subscription model where you can actually literally give day by day an ROI yeah. score. You know how you're doing, right? That's that's awesome. Not all software companies have that luxury. Um, and then the third thing I look for is the team. Is the team good? And, and this team is small and mighty. Y'all have been together through multiple startups and uh, had great exits and are committed to this thing as a, uh, as a group. And it's just infectious. And so I, uh, I'm, I'm super honored and excited just to be a small part of it. Uh, you're, you're making me blush, man. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> now it's, it's good to step back and, 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 you know, take, take the wins and think through the success and wh- how we've gotten here. And, um, you know, and, and it's just, you know, but we're looking forward to the, to next, to the next phase, you know, to your point, um, to, kind of uh, adopt and change Mark Andreessen's quote, subscriptions are now eating the world and they're everywhere for better or for worse, but it's the reality. And, um, you know, what we want to do is just <clears throat> make sure that um, we, tr- you know, subscriptions are, are an interesting thing, right? It's, it's a relationship. It's an ongoing relationship. And some t- in any relationship, there are tension points. And what we want to do is make sure that um, everybody who is a subscribed to a product, um, feels like they're seen, gets their, their needs met. Um, and it's done in a customer centric user friendly way. Like there never any dark patterns, never any, um, you know, uh, a billion emails. If your payment doesn't go through once, you know, like we, yep. we want to bring respect back to this, this relationship at scale all, all across the world. And there's, you know, even legislation doing that in places like uh, New York and um, California, and then you know, internationally, Europe and India have some really interesting laws around subscriptions. And because that respect hasn't been um, present, it's been abused. That relationship has been abused. So yep. Yep. Um, that's a big focus uh, for us, and especially too on the data side. You mentioned, you know. Um, we respect our customers too to show them how good we're doing. We're not going to hide that. If it's not, if we're not doing a good job, then we're all going to know about it and we can fix it. Yeah. Um, so that goes many many layers deep. So, yeah, you're going to help us with the next phase. Um, you know, it's been two and a half years, kind of figuring out who we are, and then you know, off to the races for the next three to, to ten. Right? Yeah, it's exciting. You have a lot. Of, there's a lot of headroom. For, for what Turnkey is doing. And so just excited to be a part of it. Love it. Love it. Um, well, let's keep talking about you. I want to talk about, um, just close out <clears throat> um, with a few questions. And I just want to understand your love of customer success and, and what drew you in and, and what keeps you interested there. And this is a little, um, uh, you know, selfish on my part too, because I, I like understanding how people continuously um, you know, in stay in a single space and learn from it, enrich it, and all that. Yeah. Um, I grew up working for my parents when I was young. Um, they had they were entrepreneurs. They had uh, retail cool. stores in you know at the time it was shopping malls. You don't see many of those anymore. Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, I learned a few things from, from them. You know, one is you just got to show up every day. You got to work. Um, it, the other thing I learned from them is, is that the customer isn't always right, but they believe their perspective is always right. And you have to be empathetic to that. And so I really, I credit, you know, being working in their businesses and watching my mom and how she served our customers back then really, um, it sort of embodied that and it stuck with me. And then, you know, the third piece is quality. You know, my mom used to, um, she used to do artwork on, on these, uh, products that we would sell. She would actually hand draw this stuff. Oh, cool. And, uh, and it was always, if there was the slightest mistake in any one of those things, she'd toss the product out and start over. Even if she was on the <laughs> phone and I was like, man, it was such, such hard work, but she just, she believed in making sure that the customer got what they paid for and that it was valuable to them. And you know, so I've carried those lessons with me over time. I, when I came at, actually, when I came out of college, I, I was a techie. I mean, I was a developer, um, an engineer. I was working for a utility company right out of school in 2001 because the economy sucked because the yeah. dot-com bubble had burst. Um, this was just before 9-11 happened. Um, so you know, I learned what working inside of a big enterprise IT organization looks like. I knew I didn't want to do that forever, but it was good to get that exposure. And then I went into, I got into sort of these consulting type roles where I was working with cust- customers on a consultative basis uh, for, for years. And even in my first software company job that I had, I was still in that like pre-sales and consultative architect kind of role. And so it was, also, it was very high touch, right? But and again, back to the high touch customer success mindset, the work that I was doing hands on then was very much like hands on customer success is today. Um, as I've learned more, I just have, or as I've gotten involved with SaaS companies over the past 20 years, that's been where I just sort of fell in love with the business model, right? There's the, the metrics are, are fun to think about. They're fun to try to figure out. How to impact uh, what's going on, like Turnkey, right? Like if, if you have yep. a, a higher uh, gross cancellation rate than you want, like what what it what's it going to look like when we put a product like Turnkey in the mix, or when we add a CSM team to help drive account health preemptively? Um, you know, what, how do we make those bets and put our put our money in the right place? Uh, it's always intrigued me, um, and, and it's really more of just a pure business curiosity, I think, than anything. Um, and then, you know, over the past seven years, I've just done a lot of writing. It, mm-hmm. Like I like talked about at the top, right? It, as I've tried to assimilate or I've tried to sort of process what I've learned, writing about it help, has just helped me grow my love for, for SaaS and B2B technology, B2C technology and subscription business models mo- more than anything else. So um, I, I don't know. I just... It's, Partly, I guess it's what I know. I've always been around this stuff, and um, and that's what what's kept me interested in it as long as I have been. Now, that's powerful stuff. I I didn't know about um, your your parents and owning the shop. That's was it was it in? You know, so you said actual like malls. You know, you're in yeah, uh, yeah. shopping wow. shopping malls and like strip malls. So oh, wow. it, was, it was like a it was a um, uh, like a gift in candy kind of store so oh, yeah. it, it wasn't you know these weren't it wasn't um rocket science it was just good basic straightforward business and right. you know you serve the customers and you do it in a high quality way and there's other stories i can share from that too about you know how we tried to create quality products and and uh for our customers but and, and it worked i mean customers came back and you could really see the value of the repeat business even if you sell yeah. products not on subscription, you still need repeat business. That's how business grows. Word of mouth, repeat business, and you know. So totally. it's all the same at the end of the day. Are they uh if you don't mind my asking, is are the stores still around? They are not. No, oh, they man. are not. Uh, you know, as as um malls got put out of business, yeah. They they sort of went w- by the wayside and we never transitioned that business to be like an online kind of thing. I think we had that opportunity, but it just we it, we we didn't know how to do it back then because yeah. it was new, right? We had no yeah. clue how to really do it. And Shopify didn't exist, or you might have, right? Yeah, you had to call up the gateway companies and you know, exactly. whatever, whatever, all that stuff. Yeah, got it. Yeah, you buy a million dollars worth of 
hardware to put in a data center, which we don't have to do any of that anymore, luckily. Right, right. Um, so in terms of uh, reading, watching, listening, anything you've seen, read, listened to lately that's had an effect on you? Yes. Um, the, the thing that I am binging right now is a podcast called The Founders Podcast. Have you ever heard of this? So good. You like it, David Senra? Yeah, it, um, he he did one on Christopher Nolan recently, right? Uh, yeah, it wasn't Christopher Nolan. A, was he a director? Yeah, he did um, Oppenheimer and oh, Batman okay. Begins and all that. Yeah, I haven't listened to that one all the way through yet. But So for people who don't know, Founders Podcast, David Senra, highly recommend it. He goes through, basically he reads biographies of great entre- entrepreneurs. So th- all the usual suspects yeah. and then of course, like uh, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, um, Steve Jobs, of course, Larry Ellison, like all the big tech folks. But then he hits like one, one of his favorites is, is James Dyson, right? Have you listened to the Dyson episodes? That's the one that got me hooked to begin okay. with. I need to check that one out. I've always admired the guy and, uh, I read his book back in the day, but I haven't seen that one. So, yeah, it's it's so funny. Is it, I initially wrote wrote the podcast off in a way I don't, because it just seemed like such a simple thing, and like, well, I can read the book myself. Why would I listen to it? But then it just it, it's just accelerating your intake on on the topic, yeah. and he breaks it down so well. Yeah, he also does a good job of. You know, I was listening to he uh, he did an episode on Coco Chanel. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, that's the other thing. Some of these fashion moguls, like you have no clue the grit that these people had totally. to go build their empires. And but one of, one of the things he'll do, like even if it's Coco Chanel, right? He'll 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 say, you know, sort of walk through the story of their life and their business and what happened, and he'll be like, yeah, this is just like when Warren Buffett says this or when. You know, Jeff Bezos says this, and he sort yeah. of does a really nice job of of bringing multiple stories together every time he tells the story. And you know, to your point, you can consume basically the equivalent of a book in an hour, as opposed to I don't know. I'm a slow reader. It would take me you know 12 hours to read some of those books that he's he's summarizing for me in an hour. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And I and when he can when he's starting to create, you know, the connections of basically his notes and database and his thinking, that's when it starts to really like, Oh, okay. You know, like the lights, the lights come on in my head and, um, then you start making it less about the person and more about a process or a way of thinking. Right. Yeah. That's cool. One of the things he says, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, after you. I was going to say, one of the things he says in there, which I really like, is um, history doesn't repeat itself, human nature does. And, you know, when you think about the things, the, the kind yeah. of determination and grit and um, beliefs that you have to have to get a company off the ground, it's like, this are just good reminders to have in my ear every day, right? For Whether sure. I'm building this business that I work in now, which is now currently my entrepreneurial right. um, pursuit or anything else, or, it's, you know, participating with turnkey with you with you guys yeah you know it's all about the inputs so i love it i'm gonna go fire up some episodes after this um (laughs) uh, all right closing question what's the craziest thing you wish you could do right now but can't oh man um i don't know if it's crazy uh but you know, w- one of my ambitions professionally is to to run my own company again at some point. So I had um, I was the, the I guess you could call me the CEO of my consulting firm, which we were a very small firm. So CEO was definitely an aggrandized uh, kind of title for what we were doing. Um, but that that's the thing I really want to get back to is, is running running a business in its entirety. Yeah. Um, and you know, right now is not the time for that for me, but. Um, but that that's something that I'll that I'll do hopefully in the next five to ten years again. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, hey, yeah. appreciate your time. Awesome catching up. And um, this is a great one. Appreciate it. You too, man. Let's do more of these. Definitely. See you. Don't miss out on future episodes. Get alerts for new drops at subscriptionheroes.co or follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Special thanks to Churn Key for sponsoring the show. 
Learn how to make customers happier while boosting revenue at churnkey.co. Your support for this show has been incredible so far, and let's keep the momentum going. We are all slaves to the algorithm. Ratings and reviews really do help. Please rate us five stars on your platform of choice. We'll be truly grateful. That's all for now. I'm Scott Herf, and this has been Subscription Heroes.